Hey, grab your Bibles, fire up your devices, go to Daniel chapter one. Man, I don't know about you, but singing those songs about Christ and Christ, oh man, what great reminders. I mean, if you've been like me, you've probably been hit with a thousand different messages all week long uh, about, about who you are and what you could be if you'd buy this product or if you would do these things. Just really uh, desiring the flesh, and it's great to come to the church and to be reminded that it's about Christ. It's uh, in him alone that we find our fulfillment, we find our peace, we find our purpose. If you want to use the, the notes there in the middle of the bulletin, you can fire up your app there and they will be there as well. You know, last week we talked about the signs of the times and really you can see one of the signs of the times, I believe, is the reckoning of the Lord God with his church. Have you noticed as of late in the past year or so, he is purifying the church? He is cleansing and purging her of leaders that, that really aren't fit to serve. Uh, another, another famous evangelist or apologist or preacher went down this week. It just seems like one after another after another, the Lord is purging his church. He's purifying her. We've seen prominent leader after prominent leader fall from grace. Not to mention all those that are, well, in obscurity. And why is that? We only come to find out that they'd lived a life of moral compromise and it was in the secret. I'm sure they didn't start out to be, uh, well, to fall from grace, to live a blasphemous lifestyle. It started with one little compromise, which led to another little compromise, which led to another little compromise, which led to big, bad, and ugly things. But it's not only in the church. We're seeing folks from all segments of our society being exposed for living these secret and wicked lives. We see it uh, in Hollywood, uh, into, well, Washington, D.C., into the state house. We're seeing people being exposed for their wickedness. Why is that? Well, they started out with a small little compromise and another little compromise, and it led to full-blown sin. You know, it's interesting when you think about compromise. I was talking to a high school principal, and I learned that cheating amongst students is at epidemic levels. And what I found most interesting as I was talking with some of uh, our staff who had just graduated college, Christian colleges, they said, oh, it's just as rampant on the, in the Christian university. A little compromise, a little compromise, a little compromise. You know, the moral fabric of our culture is in serious decline. I mean, the most obvious signs of moral decay in our nation are the prevalence of fatherless homes, the breakup of families, the amorality of our educational system, the eruption of criminal activity. But there, there are other signs as well. How about the decline of civility? Have you noticed that? The lack of integrity in both public and private life, the, the growth of litigation as the chief way to settle every dispute. As we look at what's going on in our world, we ask the question, why? And I can answer it in one word. It's compromise. Look at your notes there. I want to define this word, make sure we're using the same vocabulary, the same dictionary. So when we mention these words, we're on the same wavelengths. We're talking about the same thing. So what does compromise mean? Look at it there in your notes. It means to make a dishonorable or shameful concession. And so one compromises when they make a dishonorable or shameless concession to get ahead, to achieve happiness, to simply, well, get the means met. You know, we're moral beings. We've been created on purpose and for great purpose in the image of God. We were never created to live by embracing our fleshly desires, but by embracing him, Jesus Christ, living for him, for his glory. I've been asking this question a lot lately. I've brought it up numerous times here on Sunday mornings. Why are we the most worried, nervous, anxious, and depressed people of all time? Why is that? Every study you see proves this point. Uh, anecdotally, you and I could answer the question and say, yeah, that's very much true. Why is that the truth? Because we try to live our lives apart from the one who created us. That's why. We attempt to live our lives by rules uh, that we create rather than the rules of the one who created us. When you compromise the truth of God's word to your desires, you're always going to get devastation. 
And we're seeing that devastation all around us. Maybe you're seeing it in your own family or your own life. Let me remind you to be a critical thinker. If you recall, just a few weeks ago, we talked about being a critical thinker is we're going to base our lives on absolute truth. We're going to keep our emotions in check to the word of God because our ultimate goal in life is to live for his glory, which will bring about our ultimate holiness or, or wholeness. And you can live this way, by the way. I know it seems difficult. It seems hard. It may seem impossible, but it's not. For the believer, you can live this way. You can live holy. You can live whole. Hey, friend, listen to me this morning. You can be whole emotionally. You can be whole, well, spiritually. You can be whole mentally if you'll live according to the ways of God. Now, it may be a path to get there, a process, but you can achieve it. You know, on the way to church this morning, uh, I had my three middle boys with me, and we were talking about you know, the snow's melting off, it's going to get muddy out there, and talking about how fun it would be to go off-roading. And so I told them, I said, do you think my Honda is made to go off-roading? And all the boys says, no. I said, well, what would happen if we took off through that field and, you know, jumped over the, the creek and, you know, went up on that little hill? What would happen? And one of the boys says, you'd break your car. I go, that's exactly right. I said, you know, boys, that's exactly what happens when we try to live our lives by our own set of rules rather than the set of rules by our creator is we break our lives. Maybe you're here this morning and you've got some brokenness in your life. Well, welcome to the club. We're all there. Varying degrees, of course. Maybe you have broken relationships. Maybe you have other brokenness that you're dealing with. You know, that brokenness is there because one, we live in a fallen world and two, because we've added to it because we try to fix it using our own power, our own resources, our own wisdom, but the Lord has a better way. So I want to show you a biblical principle here. Look at that principle in your notes. You can live with uncompromised integrity in a compromised world. That's the truth. You can do it. How do I know that? Because the word of God tells us in 2 Peter 1, 3, for his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. He's given you the power to live this way. And now, my friends, it's going to become more and more important that you access this power by walking rightly with the Savior in his word through obedience because the world is a changing, if you haven't noticed. And those of us with Christian convictions, those of us who live a biblical, Christ-centered, God-honoring life are going to be looked at, well, with a jaundiced eye ever more so as the days come rolling by. You know, even now there's a piece of legislation in the House that's trying to pass. It's called the Equality Act. That sounds nice, doesn't it? We're all for equality, but you know what that's going to do? It's actually should be called the Inequality Act because if you hold the Christian sexual ethics, you will be deemed unfit and be in trouble. And so my friend, in the days ahead as we see the signs of the times and the culture is changing and as they look, well, differently and negatively at those in the household of faith, will you be a person of conviction or will you compromise those convictions to get by? That's really the question for all of us. Will we hold to our convictions that the Lord has given us in his word that bring him honor and bring him glory? Or will we compromise those to make life what seems like in the fleeting moment easier? That's when we come to the book of Daniel. Daniel is an individual who didn't compromise his convictions even when the world well, I wanted to harm him for standing for truth. And let me give you a little context of the book of Daniel here. You know, throughout history, foreign armies would invade uh, nations, and then they would take those people captive. And in some regards, they would take the entire city or nation and move them back home and take people from back home and place them in those cities so they knew they had loyalty. And so same thing happened here. Babylon comes in and takes over, and they separate families. 
usually for lifetimes. As far as we know, Daniel was taken from his family by the Babylonian military and, well, was never returned and the ransacking of Jerusalem in the 7th century B.C. Someone asked me, what does B.C. stand for? Before coronavirus, that's what it stands for. (laughs) You see, as a young boy, Daniel was uprooted from his native land of Judah and he was re-transplanted in this wicked place called Babylon. And many of his experiences are going to be recorded right here in this book that bears his name that we're going to be studying. And as we work through the verses of this great book, we're going to learn a great deal about our God and how to respond to him. We're going to learn a great deal about his strategy in human history And we're going to learn a great deal about those around us and how we can stand with conviction even when those around us condemn. So let's read a section of Daniel chapter 1. If you'd stand with me in honor of reading the word of God, we're going to be in Daniel 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. And let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youth who are eating the king's choice food. And deal with your servants according to what you see. And so, Father, bless the reading of your word. And teach us, correct us, and train us in righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. So you see what verse 1 and 2 are telling us is, Nebuchadnezzar, well, he invaded Judah. These events took place around 605 BC, uh, and they were hauled off to Babylon. Now, here's what's interesting. I'll give you just a quick little history lesson, just a, a basic little context of what's happening. This ransacking of Jerusalem took place after the Battle of Carchemish, where Nebuchadnezzar almost annihilated the Egyptian army, which put them at the forefront of the world's superpowers. This uh, battle at Carchemish made them the world's superpower, which, bottom line, everything to the south of them, uh, Syria and Palestine, all the way to the border of Egypt, was essentially in his control. All he had to do was, well, move. And that's exactly what he did. He moved as far south as Jerusalem, but he also not only wanted to take over the land, he wanted some able bodied men to train to help him lead his growing empire. He needed the best of the best to train and uh, uh, to uh, educate so that they could help him rule this ever expanding rule that, well, Nebuchadnezzar desired. Every city was made up uh, to give their finest young men. Jerusalem had to give Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
Now, we know from extra biblical accounts that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, that's a hard word to say if you say it four times, Nebuchadnezzar's wartime activity was, was paused because he got word from back home that his dad, the king, had died. And so he stopped expanding the kingdom and he returned to Babylon to be crowned king. And he brought all of these young men and all of the material goods with him. And man, let me tell you, Babylon was the city of opulence and luxury. Although Daniel and his three friends were of royal lineage, they lived pretty uh, simple lives. They had never seen the likes of great Babylon. It's interesting if you study it, they are famous for their hanging gardens and just the, uh, just the sheer magnificence of this, this city. And here they are, Daniel and his three fin- friends find themselves in a far off place, captives of this newly minted great king, Nebuchadnezzar. And so there becomes a test of compromise. Look at your notes there. Do you see it there? Daniel and his three friends were chosen as candidates for the king's service. Do you see it there in verse 3? Look at it with me. Open your Bibles and look at it. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. So this summons is going to lead Daniel and his three buddies to a great test, a massive test of integrity and faith. And so Ashpenaz had to follow certain very specific criteria in selecting these young individuals to go through this program, to be servants of the king. Did you pick up on it there? Did you see it in verse 4? They had to, well, be youths. The Hebrew word for youths refers to teenagers, most likely 13, 14, 15 years of age. Can you imagine? These are junior high and like uh, early high school students taken out of their families, away from their homes, and dropped off here in this opulent lifestyle to be in service to the king. So put that in the back of your mind as you see the convictions of this young Daniel. Oh, may our young people have the convictions of Daniel and his three friends. Second, they were to be defect-free. They could have no uh, physical or mental handicaps. Third, they were to be good-looking. Fourth, they needed to be intelligent. And fifth, they had to possess the ability for serving in the king's court. Did you see that there? These were some special individuals. Daniel and his buddies were, well, they were the cream of the crop. They were excellent young men. They were just right for this program for King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at that next fill in the blank there. They were enrolled in a three-year program to rewrite their character. Do not misunderstand what's taking place here. This is a very sophisticated, well-thought-out system of retraining the character and faith of people brought in from other nations. Notice something very interesting. This process was designed to erase their faith and character of their homeland and impress upon them, well, the, the pagan culture of King Nebuchadnezzar. From the very beginning, they would be barraged from every direction. All of their senses would be, would be hit to change them at their very core. This is why integrity is so very important, friends. This is why your integrity is so very important. Our culture is being shaped by the enemy. The Bible calls him Satan. Our culture... The culture that you live in, the culture that our children and grandchildren are growing up in is continually attempting to change their character, erode their faith, and neutralize their impact on this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's happening every day. You look at the Ten Commandments, it says, honor your father and your mother. I was watching some shows with my boys on Disney. Disney. Disney for crying out loud. This is wholesome families, family fun. The whole show says you're making a mockery of honor your father, father and your mother. Don't be naive, my friends. The culture is out to change your character. And it's not godly character. Look at verse five. Do you see it there? Look at what he's saying here in verse 5. He says, Youth in whom was no defect, 
who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court. He ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now understand something. This is a 13, 14, 15 year old young man. He's being given the best of the best. I mean, we're inviting him in. We're giving him big screen TVs, Nike Air Jordans. We're giving him beast mode type of clothing. We're giving him the best of the best. And we're going to expect them to say no. This is exactly what Daniel does. He's going to be service to the king. He's playing on their pride. And what happens? This curriculum steeped in the literature and language of the Babylonians, the philosophy, the religion, the magic, the astrology, the medicine, and so many other things. One of the primary goals of this three-year course was to convert the monotheistic Hebrews, Daniel and his three friends, to be, well, Babylonian polytheism pagans. Nebuchadnezzar wanted these Israelites to reject the God they worshipped and the lifestyle that they had lived and embraced in Judah and to serve the false gods of Babylon and to adopt the heathen lifestyle that he lived. Again, you're talking 13, 14, 15-year-old young men. You're saying, I'm going to give you all this. Hard to say no to, wouldn't it be? Part of the training was to immerse them in their pagan ways to eat this food that had been sacrificed to idols. The food they were given was particularly chosen for this purpose of forcing them to compromise their convictions. They knew the Hebrew people and their dietetic laws, and they chose food specifically to get them to compromise. Because once you get to compromise a little, it's so easy to compromise again. Further indoctrination. Did you notice this? Did you pick up on this? To further indoctrinate these young men. They stripped them of their Hebrew names. By the way, every one of those names, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, all have some form of the word Jehovah in it. These were godly names. These were, were Jewish names given to them by their Jewish parents in honor of the one true God, the covenant God of Israel, Yahweh. It had his name in it. They were stripped. You know what kind of names they were given? They were given names after Babylonian gods. Daniel becomes the Belteshazzar, which means lady of Marduk or servant of Marduk. Hananiah becomes Shadrach, which means the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael becomes Meshach, meaning Aku is. Azariah becomes Abednego, meaning servant of the shining one. Do you see They're trying to erase their convictions. And they're starting with all the senses. They're starting with their very identity, your name. Clearly, Daniel and his friends were being faced with a situation that would test their faith and obedience to the God of the Bible. Have you ever been in a place like that? Maybe you've moved to a new place, you took a new job, a new location, a new neighborhood, a new school. Maybe you began to work from home, go to school from home, and everything has changed, and you've never felt so alone in your life. It's in these moments that the enemy can really go about rewriting your character. It's in these times we need to be most aware, or it will be easy to compromise. I've talked to so many people in this past year who have made compromises of their faith because they were alone. Oh, friends, we've got to build our integrity. And how do you do it? You build it just like you're working out your muscles. You build it from the inside out by the power of God. Look at this next fill in the blank there. They were men of purpose and conviction who lived according to the truth grid. Do you remember the truth grid we talked about a few weeks ago? You see, the rest of this chapter tells us how the young man, Daniel, how he passed this immense test without compromising his convictions in the least. So let's see how he did it. Well, he had a truth grid. 
He had a truth grid that helped him make decisions. Help him to make decisions that would honor the Lord Jesus, that honor his, his God. He was trained in this, and he didn't waver. So here's the question for you. Are you trained in the truth grid of Scripture? Do you recall the truth grid, grid that helps you make your decisions? Do you, are, you, are you constantly bringing it up to remind yourself of the truths of the Scripture, to, to keep your emotions in check? Because your ultimate purpose in life is to bring him glory, which will bring you holiness and wholeness. You see, Daniel and his three friends had been discipled and they knew who their God was and they knew what he expected of them and he knew that he would never leave him or forget about him, but he would always stand with him. They had been taught how to make decisions using the truth grid of, well, the scriptures. That's why our series on critical thinking, the past few weeks. It was so important. If we aren't trained in how to make decisions according to the Bible, my friend, we will compromise and drop like flies. Look at verse 8. Do you see it there? But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the official that he might not defile himself. Now, look at this. Three truths to live with integrity. Three truths to live with integrity. Number one, it's in the small things that the big victories are won. It's in the small things that the big victories are won. And so he decided he would live his life based on truth. He would live his life based on glory of his covenant God uh, of Israel, Yahweh. And so he wasn't going to go down that road. He knew automatically what they were trying to do. And he says, no way, Jose, or maybe no way, Nebuchadnezzar. And he goes, I'm not doing that. Now, apparently, some of the food Daniel was to eat had been declared unclean in the Mosaic law. It was certainly true that the law frowned on eating meat of animals that were sacrificed to pagan deities. Now, Daniel, he couldn't have lived on this diet without violating the law. Do you see what this school was trying to do to him? You see what this three-year training program was trying to do? It was trying to erode his convictions, and he goes, no way. And on top of that, to share a meal in Daniel's day in this Near Eastern culture was to commit yourself to friendship. He couldn't even sit at the table with these pagans because it would mean he is friends with them and he is, well, loyal to them and he is accepting of their pagan ways. He said, I can't do that. And given this, it may also have been the case that the defilement Daniel feared so much was not necessarily a a ritual defilement, but a moral defilement arising from the the subtle flattery of all the gifts. These guys were given the best of the best. They were appealing to their selfishness and their fleshly desires and cravings. And by accepting these gifts, it would signal, hey, I support this. I'm, I'm taking this. In any case, it's clear that Daniel committed himself to remaining pure regardless of the disgrace or the danger that it would bring to him. Now that's conviction. When you can stand by what you believe, regardless of the disgrace or the danger it might bring. Romans 14, 23 says, but the one who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. That's Paul. Now at first glance, let's think about this for a moment. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. I mean, really, is it a big compromise to eat the meats? Is it a big compromise to sit at the tables? Is it really? But it's a seemingly small thing. Am I really compromising? But it's in the small matters that the big victories are won. Small victories add up to big victories. Small compromises lead up to big compromises. Now, they might be small things you choose to do. There might be small things you choose not to do because it drags you down. It makes you feel uneasy about it. You doubt it will please the Lord. Or maybe you just think, well, if I did this, how it would affect others in my life. My friends, that is integrity. When you realize your influence on others... 
I mean, yeah, you can have the Christian liberty to partake of whatever it may be, but you don't want to be a stumbling block. That's what's happening with Daniel here. And so think about it. It's in the small matters that you win the big victories. It's having conviction in the little details that add up to the big things. Number two, look at it. Their little compromises turn into big problems. Now, once he had made his decision, Daniel is wise. I mean, obviously, he got chosen as one of the wise individuals, right? He's no dummy. So what does he do? He seeks permission. Did you see it there in verse 8? It says he goes and he seeks permission. He acted out of conviction, but he did not do it uh, by being disrespectful to authority, even ungodly authority. The commander refused, said, I'm not going to do it. He said, I'm afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to cut my head off. Did you pick that up in verse 10? Look at it there. He goes, I might lose my head over this. But Daniel understood this principle. And you and I need to understand this principle as well. Little compromises turn into big problems. There's a study on adultery that's been done. It's probably 10 or 15 years old. And I was reading it. I found it fascinating. They asked a 1,000 people who had committed adultery in their marriages to uh, answer a question whether they had lacked integrity in, I think, a hundred different areas to the T. People who had committed adultery, they padded their business expenses. They told little lies. They were always compromising. And I'm going to bet you your bottom dollar. They didn't wake up one day. See, I think I'm just going to commit adultery and blow my life up. no. They made small compromises, which led to other compromises, to other compromises, to the big, bad problem that blew their life and their family up. Little things become big things. Think about it. Little sweet kitties become big old cats. Cute, cuddly puppies become big, stinky dogs. Sweet, cuddly babies become teenagers. (laughs) Little things turn into big things. If you're compromising and the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you right now, stop it. Stop it and get things right. You aren't getting away with it, by the way. The Lord knows and you know. You're not living the life that God would have for you. You're not reaping the blessings of obedience You're not getting away with it. So stop it. Deal with it today. The good news about Christianity is grace. Getting something great we don't deserve. At any moment, we get a a, a new start, a do-over. You can repent of it. You can ask him to forgive you. And you can move on with, with, well, no regret and no shame. So what can you be trusted with? Daniel acted wisely. He went through the proper channels, never treating those above him with contempt. And he believed from the outset that God would honor him and God would protect him. And he would simply reward his faithfulness. That's what Daniel believed. Which brings me to the third truth here. Do you see it there? Obedience brings blessing. We say this all the time around here, but we can't say it enough. Why can't we say it enough? Because we're not very bright. And I'm talking to myself here. I forget this principle all the time. Daniel's trust in the Lord was not in vain. And so the guard allowed him to try it. Look at verse 14. Do you see it there? So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, what happened? Him and his buddies were fatter and healthier than everyone else. That's what we learned there in verse 15 and 16. God blessed Daniel and his friends for their obedience. And so as they walked with God, not wavering, not compromising, just look at the results. Look at it here in verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one, was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. God had rewarded their faithfulness. And then they stood out. Look at verse 20. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them, look at that, 10 times better 
than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. And so in a world filled with people, including you and I who rebel against King Jesus, it's inevitable that believers of all ages are going to, we're going to face situations. We're going to come up against circumstances that, well, are going to challenge our convictions. If we continue on the track we're on as a nation, we're going to see this happen sooner rather than later. For those of you that are paying attention, it's already happening. Those of us who are parents and grandparents, great-grandparents and aunts and uncles, we need to prepare our children for those occasions by teaching and modeling integrity. Can you imagine a junior high young man like Daniel standing up to the most powerful king on earth? Because he wanted to honor God. That's conviction. That I pray we have, our children have. You know, every one of us need to personally commit well, our lives to, to living God's way, regardless of the, the temptations to live otherwise. There's going to come a day, perhaps in your life, if the Lord tarries, you're going to have to make some really hard decisions whether you're going to obey the scriptures and honor the king and live for his glory. Or are you going to protect yourself? What will you do? What will you do? Let me give you three principles I pulled from this text that I want you to memorize. I've got these printed in my journal. I put them all over the place. I want to see these and be reminded of these often. I don't ever want to forget them. I look at this past week, the article that came out about Ravi Zacharias and the secret life of wickedness and sin that he lived. You know, I'd met him on a few occasions, actually been with him at a few conferences in the back rooms, would have never known. And there's no way he started out his ministry to die and then a year later the whole thing implodes. But it started with one little compromise to another little compromise to another little compromise. If he would have just lived by these three principles, oh, he would have brought Christ's glory and saved so much headache and hurt. Here they are. You ready for them? Number one, the decisions I make today have the power to affect my entire life. The decisions you make, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions, will affect your entire life. Inner conviction can overcome any outer pressure to compromise. But you've got to have inner conviction first, and that conviction comes from the truth of the Word of God. And thirdly, Christ-honoring convictions yield Jesus-given rewards. He does reward our obedience in this life. He can do it in any myriad of ways. I believe he will always reward us with peace and joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And then one day when we get to eternity, he's going to reward us with eternal rewards. And so our Christ-honoring convictions will ye yield us Jesus-given rewards. Let me ask you a question. What do you need to do to shore up your integrity? What do you need to do? Listen, I know in a room this size, with as many people that stream with us each Sunday, there are some in this room have been compromising. Maybe you've been compromising in some areas, and you can see it leading to a really bad fallout. Hey, friend, can I just tell you in love, stop right now and reconsider. Maybe you've been contemplating compromise. Thinking, man, it sure would be easier if I could just cheat on that test. Life would be a whole lot easier if I could just pull up my phone when I'm on the Zoom call with my math test and no one would ever see it. I wouldn't have to study. I could play more video games. Maybe you've been compromising at work. 
There's not a, not a lot of accountability when you work from home. I don't know, what's the Lord convicting you of this morning? Let's do this. Would you bow with me as Sean comes to play? I believe the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to some in this place right now. And I want to give you hope, my friend. Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose from the dead to give you grace. So I don't care what you've done, how you've compromised, or or what it's led to. My friend, right now, you can receive his forgiveness for that. You can ask him to give you the muscles and the strength on the inside to make the corrections to move forward with conviction and integrity and in truth. Right now, do that if that's you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've yet to place your faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And I'd love to introduce you to the Savior. Man, it never gets old. This past week, I had the opportunity to share with a, a young man the gospel. He trusted Christ, and at 11 o'clock, we're going to baptize that guy. Maybe you want to join him. Maybe you want to give your life to Christ this morning. Maybe you're online and you're at home and you want to give your life to Christ, and you got a couple hours to get up here and get baptized. Wouldn't be the first time someone from our live stream showed up for baptism. Hey, let me tell you guys, we're all broke. We're all a little messed up. We've all faltered. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. Every one of us. None of us are perfect. But Jesus still loves us. While we were yet sinners, he demonstrates his love for us, that he died for us. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much, in fact, that he created you on purpose and for great purpose. That purpose is to live in right relationship with him by placing your faith and trust in his work on the cross and obeying his word. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says he went to the cross. He gave his body a sacrifice. He died. He rose again, proving he is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. And if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Isn't that good? What does it mean to be saved? It means your sins are forgiven. Everything you've ever done wrong, wiped clean. Your past wiped out. Your shame and your guilt gone. You get Jesus in this life and for all eternity. So friend, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If that's you, simply pray a prayer like this. Say, dear Jesus, I believe. I believe you are who you say you are. And I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be my savior. I'm trusting your work on the cross and your resurrection to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's do this. Would you stand with me? Man, I'll be here if you need prayer as we sing, myself and Heath. We'd love to pray with you. As we sing and worship the King, as we, well, shout out these lyrics. Think of what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to you. And act. Today's a new day. It's a brand new day in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can can be forgiven of your past and you can start fresh today. Let him take the weight. He says, cast all your anxieties, all your cares on me. He'll give us rest. He'll give us peace. Would you receive his peace today, Christian? Let's worship. Father in heaven, speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church family, thank you so much again for joining us today. And Pastor Chris, as you were starting your message, you you asked a question that really marinated my mind throughout the whole message is, is it really possible to live in a compromised world with uncompromising Mm. integrity? And I was drawn back to the message series that you just got done preaching where you helped us really establish this critical thinking grid that will inform our decisions in in a compromised world. And I wonder if we could, you know, talk briefly about how that grid really informed not only Daniel and his friends later on in in the book of Daniel, but really helps us as we deal with a compromised world. No, I agree. It really does. God has given us all we need to live a life of purpose and godliness. That's right. And really, you're exactly right. That truth grid, we can see take place in Daniel's life. We can see that he's lived his life based on absolute truth. It's based on Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, not upon the the Babylonian culture, but he's going to be basing his life on truth. 
which he's going to keep his emotions in check. Because I'm going to tell you, about, to be honest with you, what all he's going through, he could easily let his emotions run rampant and, and fall prey to, uh, well, uh, fear and uh, in consternation and well just simply uh, fall in line with what the Babylonian guards are asking him to do because ultimately he's living his life for one result and one result only it's for God's glory it's for his glory which brought about his holiness and his wholeness and that's how we operate every day we need to be continually reminded of the truth that's why we need to be in the word of God so we're reading the E100 plan together as we root our lives in scripture it's easy for us to well, ground our emotions to truth and be reminded daily we live for His glory. And when we do that, oh my friends, we won't compromise and we will live a life that puts Him on display. Really, you might think of it like this. Our lives are to advertise His attributes. Mm-hmm. We best advertise His attributes when we're living for His glory. That's right. And so church, I want to encourage you, stick with us mm-hmm. over the next few weeks as we continue to unpack the book of Daniel and really get a good example of critical thinking, yeah. a good example of living with a biblical mm-hmm. worldview in a compromised world. And so we would invite you back next week. Join us right here online or come visit us in person, 8 mm-hmm. and 11 at our Greenwood campus, 930 at our Raymore campus but we'll always see you right here. Let's pray and let's uh, go into our week. Father, thank you so much for the example of biblical integrity that we see in the book of Daniel. And I pray that uh, not only would we understand it, but we would emulate Mm -hmm. the life of Daniel in our own lives. So Lord, give us the strength. Give us, as Pastor Chris would say, the muscles on the inside to live for your good and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.